So our last WLAN security topic is going to be talking about guest networking. So we'll focus this in on the unified wireless network. Guest networks typically contain one or more of the following components. So guest is, well, I should step back and say guest. It's basically anytime we want to provide network connectivity to non-corporate uh, people. So visitors coming in, you know, customers or whatever it's going to be. Um, but the, sort of the defining thing about a guest is that they have connections on devices that you don't control. So if you don't control the devices, you don't know whether they use antivirus, you don't know if they're patching, you don't know if they have infections of virus or malware. So you generally want to be protecting your network from these. So we're, we're kind of segregating these guests over onto a separate network that we can control and protect our internal uh, assets from these guest devices. The other thing that we um, need to focus in on with guests is that we need to make the network pretty easy to access. Because one, obviously we're not configuring profiles on the client devices, so we don't want any fancy security stuff going on. We don't know how good the people are at configuring their stuff, so we want to keep it as basic as possible. So a classic guest type network sort of looks like this, any combination of these types of things. The network is an open network. So on the layer two security policy, we choose none. We're not doing WEP, we're not doing WPA, pre-shared keys, EAP, nothing. Um, open network makes it really simple. We then probably have some layer three authentication, which means when they connect up to the network and they try to get to a web page, we redirect them to some sort of different web page. And we have two basic types of web pages we can redirect them to. One, that's a web authentication page, which means we're only going to let them on if they supply a valid username and password. And then we would have to make sure that you know they learn the username and password. Either it's a shared password that everyone uses, or it could be a little more fancy where each guest that comes in gets their own unique username password, whichever way you want to play it. The other type of web page we can redirect them to is referred to as a pass-through page or an acceptable use policy page. They don't have to provide a username password here, but we do want to redirect them and at least you know give them a little corporate spiel and say, you know, do you agree to the terms of service or whatever it is? And they say, yep, I agree. That's what we want, to just sort of cover our butts legally or whatever it's going to be. So web auth, username, password, pass through or acceptable use page, no username, password. Then we're going to be placing them on some sort of a segregated guest VLAN of some sort so that we can apply policy on that VLAN. And then we may be doing some sort of an auto anchor scenario where we tunnel these guests all the way out to our DMZ as opposed to dropping them off internally on our internal network here. So I would kind of understand how these different components work as well as the, the, the guest access progression. So rather than try to have bullet points about this, I'm going to configure this in front of you, show you how it all works, watch a client connect up, and just sort of to see how things operate with the guest network. Okay, so the type of guest network we'll design will end up looking like this. So I have some APs on WLC2. This will be our internal controller, also referred refer to as the foreign controller. We're going to do that auto anchor scenario. We'll tunnel that to WLC1 which will be our DMZ controller. So we'll pretend it lives in a DMZ. It's also referred to as the anchor controller. And then the client will drop off on the VLAN. We'll go ahead and put them on VLAN 11. We'll redirect them to a web page. We'll do a web authentication. Which ends up being hosted on wireless LAN controller 1. And then we'll sort of watch the progression here. So how can we, you know, put all the pieces in place to get this configured? Well, let's just take a quick look at WLAN controller WLC1 and WLC2. Right now, WLC1 um, does not have any access points on it, which would be very typical of a DMZ-type controller. WLC2 does have a couple of access points on it, so this is our internal controller. If I look at my controller interfaces for dynamic interfaces, I do not have VLAN 11 on my internal controller, and that's fine. I don't need it there. 
I do need VLAN 11 on my anchor controller, so let's go ahead and configure that. So we'll create a new dynamic interface, place it on VLAN 11, assign it to some ports, so let's say primary port 1, backup port 2. We need an IP address on the interface, so some unused IP address on the VLAN. Default gateway, and a DHCP server to use my switch. The default gateway to switch should be uh, set up for DHCP services, so I'll target that. Okay, if I want to tunnel up these WLANs, one of the requirements I have is that they need to be in each other's mobility domain list. So let's go ahead and look at our mobility group list or domain list. You'll see it referred to as uh, either way. All right, so they're not in there right now. We just have the local entry in the group list. So I need to add them together. So all I need to do is choose new, and then I just need to populate the information about controller two. So I could just copy the MAC address, copy the IP address of controller two, and then the mobility group name. Apply, so I could do it like that. I can also do this process where I do an edit all, and I can sort of copy paste within these text boxes, one of my personal favorites, and I just need to add in the mobility group name because we need all three pieces of information, MAC address, IP address, mobility group name. Both ways just get the same job done. Okay, so now they're in each other's list. Eventually I want to see the status move into a state of up, which hopefully it eventually will. It just takes a few minutes uh, to make this happen. So, okay, we got the control plane up. Shortly we should move into a fully up state. So I'll keep on going and assume this is going to complete. Okay, next step, let's go ahead and configure the WLAN. And we need to configure the WLAN on both controllers. One, we need it on the foreign or internal controller because that's what's going to advertise it to the access points. So I absolutely need it there. And then we need it on the controller one so we can um, reference it as we tunnel uh, the, the clients between the controllers. So one of the big rules when doing this auto anchor tunneling is when I configure my SSIDs, they need to be configured extremely identically with very, very few exceptions. So I'll try to tell you the exceptions as we go along. So I'm just gonna be kind of com configuring it in both controllers one screen at a time. So I'll go ahead and just call it guest pod one. One, the ID number can be different. That's okay, the WLAN ID number does not have to match. So in this case, it doesn't match and that's fine. Okay, so we'll just keep this pretty simple. Turn it on. The interface does not have to match because very often we have different interfaces between an internal controller and an external controller. So on the internal controller, I'll just leave it at management. That's fine because it's the configuration on the anchor controller that determines where is this client going to drop off onto. So I'll go ahead and say we're going to drop this client off on VLAN 11 on the anchor controller. Okay, security. This definitely needs to match up. So on a layer two, we're going to do an open network, which means none. Layer three, we'll go ahead and do a web authentication. So I turn on web policy and choose authentication. Again, web policy, authentication. And I'm just gonna leave everything else as is, but definitely you know, everything in here is the same. Everything on the advanced tab has to be the same. Security, you know, I think AAA servers might, be, we could specify different radius servers. Um, that might be one difference, but as much as you can, make everything as the same as possible. Otherwise, we're gonna run into problems. So we'll save. Okay, now we need to link these up. So at, at the moment, we just have two controllers that happen to have the same WLAN configuration, but we don't have that auto anchoring configured. So once I have my WLAN from the WLANs list, if I go all the way over to the right to the blue box, I'm gonna choose mobility anchors. So on the internal controller, the foreign controller, you know, we're, we're trying to tell, okay, who's the anchor controller? So 10, 10, 111, 10 is the anchor, which is wireless LAN controller one, mobility anchor create. This tells controller two, 
to send the clients out to controller one. On controller one, I need to do a similar configuration. I need to say we're doing mobility anchoring, so um, you need to expect these mobility, um, you know, these client sessions being sent to you. Who's the anchor switch? Well, controller one is, so we choose local. If we neglect to do this on controller one, controller two, you know, it would try to send the entries over to controller one, but controller one would be like, I don't, I don't want that. I'm not configured to do auto anchoring. So you need to configure it on both sides. All right, so at this point, we are almost ready to go. Uh, one other thing I need since I'm doing a web auth WLAN, we need some sort of username password to authenticate with. So you'll find that under security, local net users, and then we'll create a new one. And I'll just call it guest with the password of guest. Okay, so what did we all do? We got my interface configured on WLC1. We configured controller one and controller two in each other's mobility group list. And let's see if the, the tunnel or the, the link came up all the way up. We got all the way up to a status of up on both sides, hopefully. Yep. We configured the same WLAN on both. Once the WLAN was configured, we configured the mobility anchors. And then I configured a username password to use for the web authentication. So I believe at this point, WLAN controller two should be advertising this guest network. We should be able to connect up to it. So let's go ahead and give it a shot. And we can watch the progression of the guest authentication. So over here, I have a Wi-Fi client. It is using AnyConnect. So this little icon right over my shoulder here is the AnyConnect icon. So this is my supplicant. All right, so here's guest pod one. I'm seeing it advertised. Connecting to it, acquiring IP address. So this is, should be tunneling me to controller one. Controller one is dropping me off on VLAN 11. And there I pulled an IP address of 10.10.11.150. So I pulled an IP address on VLAN 11 like I thought I should. Now let's take a look at what things look like on the controllers. So I'm going to see a client session on both controller two and controller one, the foreign and the anchor controllers, but they'll look a little bit different. So there's my client session on controller two. Let's get it up on controller one. Okay, so on controller two, this is the foreign controller. This is the controller that has the access point that I'm associated up to. So I can see some you know, general information. What's my MAC address? What's my IP address? Um, what interface am I being dropped off onto? But this doesn't really apply since I'm being tunneled up to the DMZ controller. One important thing I'm looking for, the mobility role is export foreign. So what we have is this forced layer three roam. WLC2 is the foreign controller. WLC1 is the anchor controller. So that's why I see export foreign as the client uh, mobility role. And then I can see, okay, who's the anchor? 1010.111.10. So this is where the other end of that EOIP tunnel is. And the policy manager state is a run. Now a run state is actually the, the final working state that a client gets to. So once the client has connected up, fully authenticated, it makes its way to a run state. This is one difference we're gonna see from the foreign controller to the anchor controller. The foreign controller thinks everything's all perfect now. Um, you know, this client's good as far as I'm concerned. Let's go to the anchor controller and look at some differences. So anchor controller, you know, I see the MAC address and IP. We see that it's dropping it off on VLAN 11 and this is the one that counts. We see it has the export anchor mobility role, so it's got the anchor entry. Who is the peer though? I can see the peer is wireless LAN controller too. And the policy manager state is web auth required. So we're waiting for the client to go through the web auth process before we move it into that final run state on the anchor controller. So this is really the first state that we settle into once we get connect up and get our IP address on the anchor controller, web auth required. Now, a client in this web auth required state is very limited in what it can do. All it can do is you know, pull an IP address so it can do DHCP type functionality, which you know, we saw that it worked, it could pull an IP address, and it can do DNS resolutions. That's it. I can't do anything else on my client. So if I went to my client and tried to do something like a ping, you'll see it's not gonna work. Scroll up here. 
So I'll try to ping my default gateway, 10.10.11.1. Nope, that's not going to respond because I'm in this sort of restricted state. Uh, one thing I can do is I can do a DNS lookup. So let's see if I learned um, DNS information. Uh, oh, what would be... All right, so I did get a server. I, how about tennis look up Cisco dash cap web dash controller. I think I still have that entry in there. Uh, if I type it right. Proctorlabs.com. There we go. So I was able to do a DNS resolution. I resolved Cisco cap web controller to proctorlabs.com to 10, 10, 1, 12, 2. That's the extent of what I can do. Oops, sorry. Uh, DHCP, DNS. So what's going to happen? How do I progress forward? My client needs to open up a web browser. Now, normally, what we have to do would be to resolve uh, the IP address of, um, of some sort of a DNS name. And I have a DNS name, so why don't I try to... It's probably not going to work. We'll try it. HTTP... Um, Cisco dash cap wap dash controller dot proctor labs dot com. Ultimately, what we have to do is it has to be an HTTP request. It has to be a port 80 request. HTTPS will not induce a web redirect. So it has to be HTTP and it has to be a DNS resolvable IP address. So it has to be a DNS address that actually has to resolve correctly to an IP address. What's going to happen? is the controller is going to intercept that DH, the, the DNS resolution result and instead of um, sending it to the web page it wants, it'll change the result and send it to the internal web engine on the controller. So we'll see if this works. I haven't ever tried this. Uh, normally I don't have a DNS entry as I'm going through scenarios like this, so this, this is working though. All right, so I resolve Cisco Cap after controller at proctorlabs.com. It's trying to do a web redirect. Um, now the web page is an HTTPS web page that it redirects to, and my browser doesn't like the, the cert, so I get a cert warning. I'll just go ahead and click through that cert warning. And then here's the web authentication page. So I just need to supply some correct credentials here. Once I log in correctly, submit. Now, I should move into a run state. So if I go back to my anchor controller and refresh, there we go. I successfully authenticated. Now I'm in a run state. Now my client can do whatever I'm allowed to do on that VLAN. So I can go back. And now I should be able to complete that ping. I guess I'll have to just retype it in. Ping 10, 10, 11 .1. There we go. Our, my restrictions have been lifted since I'm no longer in that web auth required state. So from the client perspective, just to rehash that, the client needs to pull an IP address, which it can do. It needs to learn about a DNS server and a DNS suffix because it needs to do a DNS resolution in order for this to work. Pull up a web browser. Go to any HTTP page, port 80 web page and type in a DNS name that resolves to an IP address. The controller intercepts the DNS uh, resolution response, instead sends them over to the internal web page. You'll notice the IP address at the top of this page. Um, well, if you saw it before, it was actually the IP address of my virtual interface IP. So the virtual interface is the target of our web redirect. We type in our username password, hit submit as long as I was successful. We move into a run state and my restrictions are lifted. I can talk to whatever this VLAN allows me to talk to. So that would be configuring the guest network as well as the progression of the guest authentication and how to make it work from the client perspective.